Father, as we gather as your people, we count it as a privilege and a joy to sing praises to you, to lift your name on high by your grace and Holy Spirit. Help us to worship you biblically. Help us to worship you in spirit and in truth. Specifically this morning, we praise your name for your son, Jesus Christ, and his humility, humble because he left the glory and the majesty of heaven to come to earth. Humble because he was born of a woman. Humble because he was born in a manger. Humble because he subjected himself to your law and he lived it perfectly. Humble because even though he was a king, he lived like an everyday man. Humble because he had, he had the attitude of thinking of others before himself. Humble because he came to serve instead of to be served. Humble because he submitted his will to yours, as we've read in your scripture, even to death on a cross. That he would suffer, that he would pay the penalty for our sins so that we would not have to. And that our sins would be forgiven and that we would be adopted into your family. Totally unearned, totally undeserved. Father, by your grace and by your Holy Spirit, 
Grant us servant-like humility. Jesus served. Father, help us to serve one another as well. Father, by your grace and Holy Spirit, transform us by your gospel. Being humble, being a servant is not natural and is certainly against the ways of our world. And so we desperately need your help. And now we pray together the prayer that Jesus taught his very first disciple, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now using the Apostles' Creed to declare Uh, what we believe in common. It'll be on the screen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell, Third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen an ordination service for Scott Smith and uh, prayers by the presbytery and commissioning and sending them out uh, as he and Amy head to Minnesota as church planners. We've heard throughout the Gospel of John, uh, God's missionary heart is sending hard and the last verse of our passage today ends, truly, truly, I say to you, Whoever receives the one I send receives me, and whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. Um, It's a a sending. And so I'm going to ask Scott and Amy to come forward that we can pray for them. And if any of our elders are present, if they would come also to pray over them uh, in a commissioning. We thought this was going to be... um, probably their last Sunday. Uh, It turns out they've got a few more Sundays with us, but this is still a good Sunday to do this, Um, and we'll take all the Sundays that the Lord uh, leaves them here for at this time. But uh, they will be heading to uh, St. Cloud, Minnesota um, to establish Faithful City Presbyterian Church up there, and we're excited about that. And so, uh, they covet your prayers, your support, your encouragement as they go and do that, and uh, you're certainly welcome to participate uh, in their service this afternoon at four. We'll have um, ministers from around the state coming to be a part of the ordination as that occurs, Uh, and that's a, a work, an act of the presbytery. And Scott has been through a a process that he has enjoyed every moment of uh, in preparation uh, for this. So, but it's important. uh, If if one's going to be sent out to proclaim the gospel, it's got to be clear that they know and that uh, they hold to the Word of God as the Word of God. It's the Word of life uh, that they're commissioned to bring. So, join with me in, uh, in praying. Father, we are so thankful that you brought Scott and Amy uh, to Lake Placid, to Highlands County, to First Presbyterian Church. Lord, we're thankful for the impact that they have made on our lives with our youth, with Iglesia and Movimiento, um, 
and the uh, elders on the board of world witness for our denomination in Presbytery. Father, we thank you uh, for Amy's impact, particularly on students through the Mason Smoke Foundation and her leadership there. Uh, so they have made a difference. But Lord, we also recognize that you have been preparing them and you have put a calling and a burning in their heart to plant a church in St. Cloud, Minnesota. And so knowing that throughout Scripture we see you calling people from your church who are already blessings where they're serving to go and serve someplace else and to bring the gospel and to bring the light of Jesus Christ to make him known to others. And so we pray for your favor and all the details that are yet before them. Lord, this is scary, but they are saying yes to you, to your calling. They see your hand already at work, drawing a core group together that are hungry, who desire to reach their community and their city with the gospel. And so we pray that you would prosper them, that you would bless them, that you would equip them and you would surround them with your people and that they would see the gospel message bringing men and women and children of every age to a saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray you would strengthen them for this task that's ahead, that you would fill them daily with your Holy Spirit that even extra gifts that they don't now possess but they will need lord we are trusting you to provide in them or through others everything that is needed that your church would grow and your name would be exalted so lord we send a part of our heart to minnesota as we send scott and amy there but we do so knowing that it is your call your desire. And so we ask your great blessings and favor in Jesus' name. Amen.
Let's pray together. Father, we do humble ourselves as we open your word. We thank you that you have preserved your word for us and that even now your Holy Spirit will be at work in our hearts and minds and our lives. That your word would not just stay on the pages. That it would not just stay within these walls. But that your word would lodge in our hearts and minds and go with us into the world for you send us there to make your great name known and your great salvation in Christ declared. So we pray your blessing on the reading and hearing and the receiving of your word today. In Jesus' name, amen. This section of John's Gospel, the chapters 13 through 17, are a section that are unique to John and very enriching uh, for us as they complement the synoptic Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. This is the Word of God. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that His hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved His own who were in the world, He loved them to the end. During supper, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments and, taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash your feet, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, the one who has bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not every one of you. For he knew who was to betray him. That was why he said, not all of you are clean. When he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. I'm not speaking of all of you. I know whom I have chosen, but the Scripture will be fulfilled. He who ate my bread has lifted his heel against me. I'm telling you this now before it takes place, that when it does take place, you may believe that I am he. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever receives the one I send receives me, and whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. Amen. What would you do now if I asked all of you to remove your shoes and announced that I was coming out to wash the feet of the men and that I was selecting Sue to come and wash the feet of the women, because that's how it is done. Would you feel a bit uncomfortable with that? If I said, we're going to pray first, when I looked up, would there be anybody left in the pews, or would you all be sneaking out, hoping I prayed a little longer? What if I invited just one person up for a foot washing? Would you raise your hand? Ooh, choose me, choose me. And if so, would you want to be the washer or the one getting washed? And what if this morning there had been 
someone, a homeless person sleeping outside the door of the church under the shelter here. And he or she was up here. Could you? Would you? Wash their feet? There was a basin and a towel ready in the upper room. It was apparently part of the preparations that had been made for the Passover. And it was customary for the washing the grime off the feet of guests. Sometimes a servant would be present to do that. There wasn't this time. If not, someone should do it. But nobody did it. No, nobody. So Jesus gets up from the table, removes his robe, and wraps himself in a, a kind of loincloth that has a, a long section as it's tied off that becomes the towel to wipe the feet after he washes them. The passage says, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. That's the wonder of the cross, isn't it? It's, it's not the appearance of the cross that, that grabs our heart. It's the wonder of this love of God in Christ that holds him to the cross. That's what put him there. That's what held him there. His love for the world, this love for his own for which he came. J.C. Ryle says, the love of Christ to sinners is the very essence and morrow of the gospel. But he goes on, but the love of Christ to saints is no less wonderful in its way than his love to sinners, though far less considered. His patience is infinite. His compassions are a well that is never exhausted. His love is a love that passes knowledge. And those whom he receives, he always keeps. Those whom he loves at first, he loves at last. His promise shall never be broken, and it is for saints as well as sinners. He who comes to me, I will in no way cast out. John describes Jesus in verse 3 as knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God. In other words, it was in full awareness of his own identity, of his full authority, that Jesus becomes the chief servant as well. It's said about Albert Einstein, that toward the end of his life, he replaced two portraits, portraits of Isaac Newton and James Maxwell, two great scientists before him. And he took their portraits off the wall and replaced them with portraits of Gandhi and Albert Schweitzer. And he said it was time to replace the image of success with the image of service. The Father has given Jesus full authority, full power to finish the work for which he had come. And as Jesus pours the water into the basin and begins to wash the disciples' feet, we're to see this is more than a courtesy. This is more than merely an ethical lesson in serving. It points to the cross. Verse 4, the words there, he says, he laid aside his outer garments. Verse 12 says that he put on his garment again. And these words that are used in these verses are the same words that he used as he spoke about his death as the good shepherd in John chapter 10 Verse 17 says, I lay down, it's the same, lay aside my life, that I may take it up again, that I may put on again. What Jesus is doing is an incredible act of humility, but it's more than that. As he does this work of the servant or the slave, 
this is a parable in action of the sacrifice of his own life. This is what he came to do. And <coughs> the disciples apparently are in stunned silence as Jesus begins to do this until he gets to Peter. Peter, Lord, do you wash my feet? And Jesus makes it plain that afterward, afterward he will know why. You will understand. His death and his resurrection are going to give meaning to this act of washing his disciples' feet. Peter's embarrassed. He's shocked. He refuses at first. How can a sinful, stubborn man accept this gesture of extreme humility and grace? We're great achievers. We, we're eager to work our way up. That ethic is in us, and, and we, we do teach it. We, we want to instill that in our children and encourage that in one another. But sometimes it gets in the way and makes us unwilling to accept the gift of the one who kneels before us. Peter's rejection of this gift is significant. It's more than just about the dust will remain on his feet. He's spurning Jesus. He's spurning Jesus' gift of grace and the cleansing blood that's going to come at the cross. The washing of Peter's feet points to the saving work of the cross. So this is more than just a, an act of humility that we are also to imitate if Peter doesn't accept this gift. He cannot receive all that Jesus has to give him. Pride. Pride is the opposite of humility. Confidence in our own goodness and our own deserving and our own ability to I'll make it myself. The Greek expression here in verse 8, I can meros, is translated here, Jesus says, share with me. And it means more than just having fellowship with Jesus. Meros is the same meaning as the Hebrew word belak, which refers to the heritage, the heritage. In rejecting Jesus' offer of washing his feet, Peter's rejecting his heritage. He's giving up the riches that can be his only through the sacrificial death of Jesus on the cross. When Peter is confronted by Jesus with how significant, how important, how essential this is, he goes in typical Peter style to the other extreme, well then wash my head, wash everything, just Give me a full bath. Again, Peter's missing the point. The foot washing is important. It symbolizes Jesus' humble death. More washings do not add to the once-for-all saving work of Jesus on the cross. And so, the first part we see in this is that this washing is pointing to the cross. Afterwards, he tells Peter, afterward, after his death and resurrection, you will understand more what I'm doing here. But there is this element also of humility in serving others. It clearly is a part of this. A few years ago, my son Jonathan, who's in the hospitality industry, and, and that's been decimated, over this past year, and it's still not good. He told me he went to a job fair in the Nashville area, and it attracted high school grads and some college students, and he didn't stay for the whole job fair. He said everybody that he talked to wanted to know what he had in management. Most of them had never even worked for anyone much less managed other people 
in their work and duties and responsibilities. No one wanted to start at the bottom. What they didn't get was that Jonathan's expectations for managers is that they were pe- are people who will do whatever it takes. If there's a need to help with uh, housekeeping, the manager will be making beds. If there's a need for help in the kitchen, he'll be working with the food service staff. If the repair team needs someone to hold a flashlight or go get uh, some more tools, whatever it takes is the mentality. And if they think that that work is beneath them, if they think that those people who do that work are beneath them, he knows they're not going to make good managers. They're probably not even going to make good employees. Jesus accepts it when his disciples address him as teacher and as Lord, for they're under his authority. And if then he's washed their feet as an example, he says, then they are part of him. They have a share with him. They have a heritage with him, and they are under obligation then to do what he has done for others. And this is a debt, actually. Verse 14 says they ought to wash one another's feet, which means they ought to lay down their lives for one another. We're to enter into the sacrifice of the cross in our relations with other people. We humble ourselves. The words of Jesus are are really very, very clear here. His brother James would write, faith without works is dead. But in saying this is what we ought to do, Jesus is not giving a command. He's very lovingly and tenderly making a declaration. The practice of humility imparts blessedness. There's a blessing in serving others. Amy Carmichael observed, if I cannot in honest happiness take a second place or the 20th place, if I cannot take the first without making a fuss about my unworthiness, then I know nothing about Calvary love. Bickerings and jealousies and competitiveness have frequently crept in to the uh, life of the disciples. Each one is quite different, and they clearly rub each other the wrong way sometimes. That happens in families. It happens in church families. We're different. But Jesus had chosen them, and he called them to be community. This is an impossibility unless they first allow Jesus to wash their feet. The treachery of Judas is noted here. That will precipitate Jesus' death, and it's going to shatter this group of disciples. It's going to shake them up when one is treasonous, when one turns against Jesus. Jesus knows what's coming, and so he warns them that however overwhelming the darkness of defeat becomes, They can still believe because he is the I am. I am telling you this now before it takes place, that when it does take place, you may believe that I am he. He wants them to know that. As Jesus has been sent to live and die as a slave, we're sent as servants to live out this foot-washing style of life And as we go, having a share of Jesus, Jesus will be received as will his Father in all of this. This missionary theme runs throughout John. Jesus has been sent by the Father. Jesus sends us in his name into the world. Again, foot washing is not being set forth here as a ritual that we must observe. It's not a requirement. It's not a sacrament. Some churches do regularly observe foot washing. There's not a thing wrong with that. 
Jesus says, if I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. It's not a bad practice to do at least once in your life. Part of the Jewish custom in a wedding, part of the ceremony. And in a Messianic Jewish service uh, wedding we had here years ago, there was a curtain set up over here. And at a certain part in the service, the bride and groom went behind it. There was a basin and a towel. And the custom is that he washed her feet. That there's an active sense of serving one another, humbling ourselves before one another in that service. Jesus stripped himself of dignity and took the lowest place to serve their highest interests as their Lord and teacher. And he says, so ought we to do for each other, what? Do what? To strip ourselves of our dignity and take the lowliest place to be willing to serve. Jesus ended with a beatitude. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Verse 17. He's saying here just the theory of service is not enough. It's the practice of service that's of value. Blessed are you if you do these things. That word, max arioe, for blessed, doesn't just mean happy. It can mean that. But we may not feel happy, and others may not look at us as being happy, but the word is richer than that. It means God's favor is upon, that we are objects of God's favor. Whether we're thinking, wow, I am favored right now in this blessing of serving someone else, and they don't even seem to appreciate it, we are favored. Peter would write in 1 Peter chapter 5, and when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Likewise, you younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. Clothe yourselves with humility. Where did that come from? Could Peter have had in mind the very thing he saw Jesus do in the upper room, he clothed himself with humility. He took off his outer garments. He put on that cloth. And, and the word here, the, uh, the Greek noun from which the verb is, is rendered, signifies knotted, that he clothed himself, that this cloth has a knot that ties it on. You've seen the robes and whatnot that are fastened with a, a knot by, by tying them up. This is the word that's being used here. He dressed himself in a knotted garment. And there's two applications. This knotted garment could be the garment of a slave. This knotted garment could be the garment of a prince. The big difference would be the kind of material that was being used for a slave or a prince. G. Campbell Morgan observed this. Could Peter have seen the knotted garment of slavery on Jesus? And before he was through, he saw that it was the knotted garment of royalty. Because Peter was being changed through what Jesus did and what he would do on the cross shortly after. And Peter was writing there to young people and to older people. And he says to all of us, all of you put on humility as a slave's garment. And as you do that, you will learn to wear the garment of royalty of the one we serve. Jesus taught this by words and he taught it by action in the upper room when he rose, 
girded himself and washed the feet of his disciples, both as a servant and as their sovereign, their Lord. One writer observed, the world is to be cleaned by somebody, and you're not called of God if, you're not a, if you are ashamed to scrub. What if our service is not appreciated? What then? What if there's no thanks forthcoming? Timothy Keller writes that servanthood begins where gratitude and applause ends. The disciples are not saying, good job, Jesus. This is great. You're washing our feet. This is wonderful. Woo! Often, service is not appreciated. It's not received well. And that's where servanthood begins. It's not for applause. It's to honor the Lord. It's to bless others. The washing of the disciples' feet by Jesus sets the example, but it's also proof that he loves his own to the end. He never stops. And it's such an act of personal humility that none of us could duplicate it. No matter how many people's feet we wash, no matter if we wash the feet of our greatest enemy, because no one is as beneath us, no matter how we imagine that to be, as we are beneath Christ. If we're to wash our greatest enemy's feet, that still doesn't come close. Yeah, Jesus, but you've never had to do what I've done. Really? But this is what we're told to do. I suspect many of us identify with Peter. He had that sense immediately that this was not right, that the roles were, were reversed, that he should have been washing Jesus' feet, not Jesus washing his feet. In the fifth chapter of Luke, you'll remember when Jesus came and they had been fishing all night and caught nothing, and he uses their boat for a little while to... As a, floating pulpit and then he tells them cast out again and when they bring in that hall that breaks the nets Peter's response is depart from me for I am a sinful man O Lord and remember what John the Baptist said about Jesus one is coming whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie again feet are involved and in the upper room, as the disciples had gathered, and they had been discussing and debating and arguing over greatness, Jesus had taught that to be great in the kingdom, you had to be the servant of all, Matthew 20, 26 through 28. The call to wash one another's feet is much more than a call for a ritual. It's a call to genuinely care for one another. Understanding that no one is our inferior. No one. I find it very, very, very difficult to imagine Jesus on his knees before me with my foot in his hand. I get me being on my knees before Jesus in devotion to Him. I can understand Jesus being on the cross easier than I can grasp Him kneeling before us with a wash basin and a towel in His hand. And because on his death, in His death on the cross, we understood that Jesus boldly took on our great enemies of sin and death and hell and he defeated them. 
At the cross, Jesus did something for us that we absolutely could not do. Absolutely. Atonement. Not just dying, but dying as an acceptable, acceptable substitute for the full atonement of, of sin. But if he's washing our feet, then he's singling us out for love. He didn't take a super soaker and just wash them all down. Each one, feet and hand, washing and then drying them with a towel. That's very personal. That's tender. That's momentous. Jesus kneeling before us, looking up at us with our feet in his hands. I still can't contemplate that. That's, that one's hard for me. I cannot atone for my sins. I know that. I can wash my feet. I cannot atone for your sin. I can wash your feet. Is that, is that what's so unbearable? Is it because we, if we understand that if we let Jesus wash our feet, then certainly we must be ready to do so for others. Jesus Christ is the Lord of the cross. I have the resurrection. But he's also the Lord of the basin and the towel. What kind of God do we follow who washes the feet of his followers? Followers like us. Are we close followers of the Lord if we're like Peter? Reluctant to have Jesus be quite that intimate, that close and that personal with us. Ministry can uh, create a mask of performance. Life can create a mask of performance. The projection of success. And everyone wants to be a winner. In contrast, Jesus never uses his power to show off. Not one example of that. He uses his power for love. And so he wasn't immediately noticeable. Humility is kind of like that. It tends to make us disappear. Which is one of the reasons why it is not very much practiced or exalted in our culture. We can't avoid it if we call Jesus our Lord. He is the Lord of the cross, but he is the Lord of the basin and the towel. And as he says in verse 16, a servant is not greater than his master. Pray with me. Lord Jesus Christ, follow us all the days of our lives until we say, like Peter, yes, Lord, do it now. Do not let us run from you forever. Hound us with the wash basin and the towel until we're clean, until we're yours. Until then, we will not know what it means to be all yours. And then following you closely as Lord of the basin and towel. Lord, help us to have the grace to serve others well. And in your name, amen. Our hymn of response is from St. Francis's prayer, Make Me a Channel of Your Peace.
God sends us out with his blessing, with that promise that blessed are you if you do these things. Blessed are you. The love of God the Father, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, rest and abide with you and with those you will serve and love in his name, now and forever. Amen.